Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash historyfangirl. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Kindle, Android, or MP3 player. Hi, I'm Stephanie Craig. Welcome to the History Fangirl Podcast. This is episode 22, Exploring Wartime Berlin. World War II and the decades before and after are some of the most studied times in history. Books about the Third Reich become bestsellers year after year, and it's a long-running Hollywood joke that if you want to win an Oscar, just make a movie about this time period. But what was it like for the people who lived in Berlin? How did things change for them as Hitler rose to power, declared war against allies and foes, and then proceeded to lose the war? My guest today is Nick Shepley, a history teacher who began podcasting to help his students, but he now helps explain modern history to enthusiasts worldwide. We chat about what Berlin was like in the 20s, what Berliners experienced leading up to and during the war, and how the war's end caused the breakup of their city. My guest today is Nick Shepley. He is a history teacher and host of the Explaining History podcast. Hi, Nick. Hi, how you doing? Good, how are you? Very well, very well. So we're going to talk today about Berlin, but specifically wartime Berlin. But before we get started, your podcast, you're actually a history teacher. How did you get started transitioning that into a podcast? Well, as with most things I do, by complete accident, I was looking to make lessons more interesting. And I thought, well, well, I'll record some stuff so I don't have to spend the whole lesson listening to the sound of my own voice. I'll record some stuff for the kids to listen to the night before. They'll understand whatever I want to talk about. Then we can get down to some interesting tasks. And um, all of a sudden, the the numbers started to grow and grow. Until I thought, hang on, I, I don't have 784 pupils. This is... <laughs> And then you go into the thousands, the tens, and the hundreds of thousands, and it's um, uh, it's just been this lovely community that's built up over the years, and you get people contacting you and saying hi, and regular listeners, and debates and discussions, and uh, yeah, people value it, and as long as they do, I'll, I'll keep doing it. Do your former students stay tuned to keep listening? Um, some of them occasionally. They're all doing much more interesting things now, you know, um, good luck to them. But occasionally you get the odd one that says, oh, I remember that thing you were saying about Richard Nixon, and I've forgotten now. <laughs> so, yeah, but it is nice. That's amazing. Uh, my history teacher, my high school European history teacher, occasionally listens to the show, depending on the topic. I believe she's an occasional listener. So I think it's super cool that you have a way that your students can stay in touch with you, even if that's not the reason. And Mrs. Harold, if you're out there, if you did a podcast, I would probably still be listening to it. 20 years later. So let's jump in. So we're going to talk about wartime Berlin, but let's set this up a little bit and talk about what was Berlin like maybe in the time between World War I and World War II. If you think of the Weimar era in sort of three easy chunks, the kind of a period of about uh, 1918 to 23 years, um, prolonged crisis, a relatively stable period, 1924 to say 28, 29 um, where things on the surface of things look as if they're quite healthy uh, economically and politically stable. And then you have uh, another crisis period from 29 onwards uh, to 33, uh, which ends in January 33 with the appointment of Hitler as um, chancellor. That bit of time in the middle, 24 to 29, is, is referred popularly as the kind of the golden age of the Weimar era. And um, Weimar is obviously stabilised by American loans, and at the end of 1923, Hitler, who's a, a kind of a, a non-entity, really, on the political scene at that point, he's this sort of rather eccentric figure in Bavaria that's a, attempted, had a, a farcical attempt to overthrow the government and has wound up with a five-year jail sentence for his troubles. The um, appetite for radical politics really seems to sort of ebb away. And Weimar instead becomes, uh, well, and Weimar Berlin, becomes kind of the epicenter of modernism. It becomes the most exciting, vibrant, culturally interesting city in the world. You get writers like Christopher Isherwood and uh, filmmakers, uh, photographers like um, Robert Kappa um, heading to Berlin. There are 
aesthetic movements like Bauhaus. There are um, there's the German Expressionism in um, in art revolutionizes um, how um, we uh, you know art in the 20th century is uh, is perceived. Berlin itself dramatically increases throughout the Weimar um, era. The size of Berlin uh, grows immensely with new modern suburbs for the working classes. Um, and it, it's generally seen as, as quite a sort of um, a progressive place. There's a fascinating kind of sub sort of sexual subculture within uh, Berlin. Um, if you, you know you want if you want the kind of the easy version of that, watch the film with like the Liza Minnelli film Cabaret, which comes from the writings of Christopher Isherwood uh, about uh, drag acts and cross dressers and um, a, a gay and lesbian subculture. And, and that gay and lesbian side to, to Berlin was was actually quite um, overt. Sort of more niche ends of psychoanalysis, sexology was pioneered by a guy Albert Hoffman, and um, a uh, the other sort of famous sexologist Wilhelm Reich uh, at, at the time. And so there was a kind of an interest in these sorts of things. But there was also the the censorship of the Kaiser era had gone, and so. Um, that seemed to be able to um, awake revolutionary energies within German society. And because you'd had a political revolution, the overthrow of the Kaiser, the establishment of the Weimar Republic, and nearly the establishment, uh, perhaps not nearly, but kind of the threat of the establishment of a, so a kind of a Bolshevik Republic in, uh, in Germany in early 1919, it's easily crushed by Weimar. These revolutionary tensions uh, eventually uh, manifest themselves into kind of culturally a, a kind of a cultural uh, mini revolution in Germany in the mid uh, 1920s. Part it, it, one of the ironies of this is that uh, this new Berlin, this this vibrant uh, kind of some might have seen it as quite seedy Berlin in a way, sort of with its its, its, its nightclubs and dancing and drinking and making merry actually helps uh, Hitler during his wilderness years. Hitler comes out of Landsberg prison uh, after serving an eight-month sentence, and he, uh, during which time he's managed to write Mein Kampf. And I'm generally of the opinion that any, anyone that can write a book as thick as a doorstep in eight months, it ain't going to be very good, is it, you know? <laughs> I always tell my students, you know, don't read it, don't read it. Not because you might sort of be infected with fascism, it's just you'll die of boredom by the time you're halfway through it. It's sort of kind of incoherent nonsense. But anyway, so um, Hitler comes out and one of his kind of obsessions, actually, is with German culture, the degradation of German culture. And he sees Berlin as being a prime example of this. I mean, obviously, in his anti-Semitic worldview, what's happened to uh, Berlin is that the you know the, the the Jews have done something to it in in his um, in his view. So what he what he he sees is the is evidence of some kind of horrible Jewish Bolshevik cultural plot to downgrade um, the the kind of traditional German values and uh, of you know uh, listening to Wagner and um, looking at kind of pastoral scenes and bucolic artwork and that kind of thing. Like a make Germany great again situation. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, fascism has that key element to it of kind of re- this idea of rejuvenation of fascisms all have one narrative that's just told in different ways that things were great a long time ago, you know, as far back as if you look at Italian fascism, as far back as uh, the Roman Empire, then bad things happened and somebody was responsible in the middle bit. And now we've figured that out. Um, all we need is a great strong man to rejuvenate things and get us back to what our to the chosen destined place in the world. Um, so all societies have a kind of a version of this and it's all pretty toxic wherever you find it. Yeah, so uh, Hitler, one of his um, chief interests, he has perhaps three um, chief interests, architecture ironically and we'll come on to that one in a moment because Berlin was going to be his kind of architectural laboratory um, foreign policy you know becoming this kind of world statesman for in, in diplomacy and war and but his one of his chief ones was culture and he thought that if German culture from the from Bayreuth to Wagner to all these sorts of things could be reinstilled in German people they would remember who they were and stop acting like these kind of cosmopolitan dandies and um, you know, knuckle down and 
build a kind of a, a, a mighty or conquering Germany. He looked at Berlin and he was, you know, pretty repulsed by it. Hitler, after 1933, spends as little time in Berlin as possible. He spends a lot of time um, at the Bavarian town of Berchtesgaden, where um, uh, at the top of the, uh, the 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 mountain above the the town was his um, uh, his his sort of retreat, the Berghof. And he could look out over the mountains and see German uh, sort of Germanic culture and Germanness in what he thought was his, his purest form. And he saw he thought Berlin was his festering sore. And one he said, well, you know, one of the good things about the war was that hopefully enough of Berlin would be raised to the ground by enemy bombers that we, he could rebuild it in his own particular neoclassical image. And it was that neoclass- neoclassical image, his architect and later armaments minister, Albert Speer, created this huge sort of 10, this sort of 10, 10 to 15 feet long diorama of um, central Berlin after the Nazis had won the war. And it was, it was going to look kind of like ancient Rome, so it was going to be very neoclassical, but in, a, in the most gigantic proportions. And I think they were planning on building, you know, the buildings even now that human beings have not quite been able to craft from stone and marble in, in, just because of their, their vastness. And um, in Hitler's final days, when sort of the um, you know dust was coming in through the ceiling due to kind of Soviet rockets, and uh, all was lost, he'd retreat down to his uh, part of the Führer bunker to look at this model and imagine what Berlin would be like. And he'd sort of really re- retreated from reality at that point. But um, anyway, I'm I'm kind of digressing. I'm I'm, I'm going into the future now. So. No, I love it. Um, about what year are we at right now? Like thirty six. So, if, well, if we um, by nine by nineteen twenty nine, the uh, that's the kind of the end of the good times of the Weimar Republic and the end of the kind of exciting Berlin. Wall Street crash happens. Germany is plunged into uh, economic crisis. There are uh, six point six million unemployed. And uh, Germany is uh, told by America in no certain terms it has 90 days to pay its loans back. Fast forward, January 1933, after three and a bit years of intense economic crisis um, and uh, rocketing support for both the uh, communists and the Nazis, Adolf Hitler presents himself at the Reich Chancellery, January 1933. And that is, if your listeners are are, list, are um, interested in, the the old there are the two Reich chancellors Reich, Reich, Reich chancelleries the uh, the old Reich chancellery which had been originally a, a palace of Prince Radzivill um, and had become the uh, in eighteen sixty seven the, the the home of the Germany's chancellors um, of the the German uh, the North German Confederation's chancellors and then eventually Germany's chancellors that can be found on the Vorstrasse or what was once there can be found on the Vorstrasse, which is just off the Wilhelmstrasse. And um, the Wilhelmstrasse that runs through Berlin, you'd probably think of it as, if you're in America, you, you would think of the Wilhelmstrasse as being analogous to, say, Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, or if you're listening in Britain, the Wilhelmstrasse is probably analogous to Whitehall or the Mall, where, um, you know, all the, uh, anything that is of any importance is clustered there including that the, the foreign ministry and that kind of, of thing. So Hitler was appointed as chancellor there in uh, January 1933. He's the leader of the, the largest party. Um, but by January 1932, there had been an, an election in November uh, 1932, which Hitler hadn't managed to win an outright majority in. Um, there's a kind of a, a, a slightly inaccurate trope that people have when they talk about Hitler. And they say, oh, he was voted into power. Well, he wasn't because chancellors in Germany are never elected directly. They are always appointed by previously the Kaiser or the Reich president uh, based on who is the leader of, of the largest party. So that one's uh, he, he never Hitler never, even after he passed, uh, he crushed the communists and that kind of thing, never managed to achieve an overall um, majority um in, in any election ever does that misconception come from the way that americans do elections because there aren't very many europeans that do direct elections of their 
of the leader, right? I, I think it is. I think it comes from a, a, lot, a lot of places that misconception. I think it's people perhaps not quite listening in history lessons. This uh, this strange thing that happens in in democracies where people find them where you you find people occasionally making oddly sympathetic noises towards Hitler and the, the likes of which well you know it's pretty awful what he did in the war and let's not talk about the Jews but you know they did want him and he did give that country a kick up the backside and make it great again <laughs> so unfortunately oh yeah I mean we keep coming to that inter- interesting phrase we keep coming back to isn't it um <laughs> well and also um it's really interesting to talk about this right now and to think about all of the times in my life where I've thought about and had to study the rise of Hitler or listen to a book about it or watched a movie about it, it never felt like it was forecasting something that like I didn't, it, it never felt like I needed to pay attention to the sign post that it was history, but not current, like that it wasn't current events. And it's just, you know, it's that Mark Twain phrase that I'm sure I'm paraphrasing wrong, but that history rhymes like it, you know. It's not going to look the exact same, but things rhyme a lot with what we're talking about right now. Well, there was um, a thing said by um, the Marxist um, intellectual Antonio Gramsci, and I'm going to paraphrase this because I can't remember the exact aphorism, but he said, basically, when you get one economic system that is in decline and before another one or another kind of economic epoch or uh, has been born, the bit in, in the bit in the middle, he said, morbid symptoms abound. And I would say that that's the similarity between the 1930s and now, is that we're in a period of unprecedented economic crisis. You know, the, the thing, the, the system that ran the world from the end of the Cold War to 2008 is dead and it's not coming back. Um, and we've been propping, propping it up with vast amounts of central banking cash and you know, keeping it alive as a kind of a global zombie economy. But it don't work, and it's 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 gone for a burden, unfortunately. And in uh, just as that was the case in um, 1929, the bit in between between 1929 and shall we say 1945, when an entirely new world economic order led by America uh, emerged, that the bit in between you could describe as as morbid symptoms, um, you know, fascism and, and war. And I, I kind of hold out hope that we can spot that one for what it is now and, and do do the important work of um, making sure there is some way for things in general to function. But anyway, we're, we're, we're digressing. <laughs> but the um, the thing, the if you if you're most of the uh, original Reich Chancellery is is gone, um, and then Hitler had built a kind of a new Reich Chancellery, which is if you've ever seen the iconic um, poster of a Red Army soldier planting a flag on um, on uh, on top of a tall building in Berlin in 1945, that's what it is. It is Hitler's Reich Chancellery. And between them was a, a an expanse of gardens. They, they shared a garden together. And underneath that was the Führer bunker, um, where Hitler retires to. That's where he has his model uh, of the of Berlin. He, he retires to there to, from sort of early 1945 until um, the end of his life. What does it feel like for German citizens in Berlin in the 30s? Like, not so much the economic side, but the political side. Like, how do they experience it? Well, I mean, it's a, it's an interesting question, and we can only have guesses. I mean, working out how people experience politics right now is hard enough, and we can look at diaries and make kind of educated guesses. But I think anything we have to say on the subject has to be tempered by the knowledge that probably we will never fully know. However. Ian Kershaw, who's the kind of um, great uh, biographer of Hitler and uh, one of the kind of the really important figures in um, the last 20 or 25 years in terms of um, his historiography on, on the subject of Third Reich, he says that people in Nazi Germany and in Berlin um, reacted to the um, the regime. Uh, he said the, the kind of shades of grey. He said the, the the blacks and the whites of it all uh, are fairly minor. So there were there were relatively few, um, you know, diehard supporters of Hitler. 
uh, and relatively few, uh, if far fewer even, um, radical opponents willing to risk life and limb to oppose the regime. Most people in the, in the middle, he refers to as being the muddled majority, the people who kind of muddle, try, try to make the best of any given situation, try to kind of no- negotiate and navigate their way around the regime and try to kind of get what they can that's positive, uh, try to ignore the ugly bits and try to deal with life on life's terms. And you think, well, that's kind of like everybody, really. That's a fairly normal human reaction to both a democratic and an undemocratic regime. There's a, um, a really interesting book um, that I'd recommend to all your uh, listeners if you're thinking about Germany at war, is Richard J. Evans's The Third Reich at War. And in it, he writes this is an incredible chapter called German Moralities. And in it, he looks at this the com- complexities and the nuances of German support for Hitler, German opposition to Hitler, and um, again, these people who navigated difficult circumstances. And the thing that emerges in that chapter, the, the loud and clear, is that um, the, the, the notion that um, Germany as a, as, a, as a nation of rabid anti-Semites is uh, a, a, significantly worthy of revision, that most German people when they hear about the Holocaust and it is an open secret, i.e. anyone that wants to know can know, but really nobody does want to know. But most people react either with disbelief, with horror, with guilt, with disgust, or they bury their heads in the sand. They just think this is, I can't do anything about this. I'm just going to pretend this is not happening. And if you look in Germany, um, in the the post-war era, um, when you get to the, the late 1960s, a lot of the uh, kind of student un- unrest of the late 1960s is based around the uh, the knowledge that the the um, the parent, the older generation, knew what was happening. There is uh, there are all sorts of accounts of people growing up in the 50s and 60s saying, you know, well, the, the 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 father has been at war, hasn't come back from the Soviet Union because he's dead. The son or daughter saying, well, you know, what did daddy do in the war? And the, the uh, traditional refrain of German mothers in that period was, oh, don't go bringing all that up again. You know, it's, it, was not, it was horrible and a difficult time. And, you know, things are good now as in the in West Germany, as, as they were from the mid 50s onwards, you know, an economic renaissance and people really uh, had a improving standards of living. So there are all these secrets. And one of the things that attracts me to Berlin all the time is that it seems to be a place that's full of kind of kind of ghosts and shadows. And the First World War, all the way through to, you know, Kennedy's visit and the Berlin Wall, down to the tearing down of the Berlin Wall. It's, it has been really the crossroads of the 20th century. Armies have come back and forth through Berlin. And, you know, the fate of Germany has really decided the, the, the fate of the world in the 20th century. And so... It, it, you, you almost feel like the, the history emerges through the cracks in the pavements. It's um, quite an eerie, an eerie place. There was um, an, another aspect to it as well, was um, the fact that things like the concentration camps are a relatively open secret. So we're not talking about death camps here in you know, places where the Holocaust happened, but uh, more kind of everyday concentration camps uh, like Dachau and Sachsenhausen. And in the initial period, uh, the there is this this sense when Hitler crushes the communists in um, uh, early 1933, and then in the summer of 1934 he crushes the the SA the the stormtroopers. Uh, there's this this sense amongst many sort of bourgeois and lower middle class Mittelstander um, Germans that well this is probably for the best, and they um, particularly with Dachau. It's possible to walk past it. It's, you know, kind of a, 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 in, in the suburbs and it's uh, visible to uh, ordinary Germans. And so it is available to be seen. And if you, if you think about the, the Soviet Union, Stalin made sure that, for example, the camps were the, the camp kind of systems were, were generally as far away as, as possible from um, from civilization. And they had a policy of things like if a, if a train full of prisoners was going was stopping through a town or a city, that it did so at, at midnight um, so that nobody could be peeking into the, the cattle trucks. And the difference is that um, the, the Nazi regime 
thought that there was um, a virtue in allowing people to see um, the, or to have knowledge of the camps. This does change slightly later on uh, because they could either think, well, I don't want to wind up in there. But more likely, they were going to go, it's probably good the camp exists because Hitler is protecting us um, from dangerous people. Keeping society safe from the dangerous individual is really what he's all about. And look, he's, he's doing his job. So there were, I think, negotiating, as people do in, in totalitarian societies, negotiating the, the state, staying on the right side of it, um, making sure that you're not in trouble, also requires you to create create all sorts of narratives as to why certain people are in trouble and why really it's that's for the best yeah, and there was a knowledge that you know you mind what you say but um, you don't go saying silly things in while well, you're queuing up for at the, at the butchers because you don't know who's listening but most of the time, there wasn't a Gestapo officer listening because the numbers of Gestapo men are relatively low considered compared to the size of the population. Most of the time, the, the, uh, the task of spying on um, German citizens is outsourced and quite voluntarily to neighbours. And um, most, of the, most of what happens with the Gestapo is that they receive denunciations um, they do have to do comparatively little investigating themselves. And so um, they, they, they do the arrests, obviously, but generally they, they get letters and um, they got so many of them that uh, uh, there were vast amounts of records, uh, amounts of leads they didn't follow up and had to you know, put under uh, in, in the filing cabinet because uh, there's just too, too many people to, um, to, to go and arrest. Was being in... Berlin as a German citizen with the Gestapo, did it feel to people like they were in an occupation? Well, no. If you were uh, part of the, um, so the, the Social Democrat Party or the Communist Party, which had been purged and many of the members had had to flee or hide or had been inside concentration camps, they probably felt that um, they were in some kind of occupation. Um, the men who had been um, chewed up and spat out by the concentration camps, because they um, the camps were there really not particularly to kill, though many of them did, but um, Himmler thought they were kind of means of re-education, of kind of reforging the Germanic soul in these sort of uh, troublesome communists. Those m- men who uh, and women who went through the camp system very often were completely broken by the experience uh, of, of forced labour and brutality and all that kind of thing and weren't likely to present much opposition in, in the future. And politically, the opposition movements are, are destroyed. But a great many people in Germany did what, you know, most people were tend to do in totalitarian situations. They um, accept parts of the regime. They uh, don't see what's happening as being particularly aberrant. Um, they are willing to shed themselves of certain uh, democratic rights in order to get what they see as being protections from the threat of communism, uh, protections from the, uh, the, the threat of mass unemployment and economic crisis. Hitler actually doesn't, does a surprisingly poor job. Again, this is a great, one of the great myths that um, Hitler sorted out that country and no mistake. It is a surprisingly poor job in actually bringing about uh, economic renaissance in Germany, and it's only really mass rearmament that is is able to to achieve that. Um, so a great many people wouldn't have felt like they were in um, they were kind of prisoners in their own country. Um, that a great many people uh, up until really hit the starts talking about war seem to think, well, yeah, yeah, you know, he's doing a good job. He's um, overturning the Treaty of Versailles and seem to be uh, improving. There's a distinction between what people thought of Hitler and what people thought of the party. Hitler as the kind of the dynamic leader figure is um, cut an awful lot more slack than the party is. And very soon after 1933, the kind of the corruption and venality of the Nazi party and the incompetence and laziness of a great many of their officials it becomes abundantly clear, and the um, the idea that um, Hitler that Germany is going to be transformed 
uh, starts to be very quickly uh, seen as being the, the kind of the fraud it, it is. Well, um, many, many Germans uh, continue to rate Hitler as a popular figure long after they, they see the Nazi party as a, a kind of yet another uh, political class who have, have let the country down. People make those kinds of, of distinctions uh, in probably most societies. They, they, they always seem willing to give leader figures perhaps slightly more leeway than their, uh, their, their, their hench. What is it like in Berlin when people realize there's going to be a war, another war? Ah, well, this is good, uh, a, a, a good point. Most people in September 1939 are surprised by the announcement of war. Hitler, up until that point, Hitler's popularity as a foreign policy figure had been based around the fact that he'd managed to dismantle the, the Treaty of Versailles bit by bit. And, but the specific point that Germans were keen on is that he'd done it without going to war. Germany had lost two million men in the previous war and been plunged into a revolution and a, a decade of uh, economic crisis. So war was not something that most German people were going to get excited by. They, uh, the, the, the previous experience was too bitter. And if you imagine the, the experience that the British had in the First World War, there's a very, very powerful pacifist movement in Britain in the interwar years. So when the answers on September the 1st, 1939, that he's, he's taken Germany to war, there's the shock. Hitler, he uh, leaves the Reich Chancellery in his limousine um, and drives down to Wilhelmstrasse to the Kroll Opera House where the uh, parts, the party um, are to be gathering to cheer him. And he assumes that the German, the, Ber the Berliners will line the streets to cheer for him because he's brought about the beloved war that they all want. And this is in his fevered imagination. And it's deserted. There's no one and nothing there. And he's stunned. He thinks this is uh, extraordinary. The, uh, the war that Hitler had brought about, uh, generally, most Berliners don't want. Now, from 19, September 1939, all the way through till April 1940, the only part of the the only war that's being fought is in Poland, which has been, been divided with the Soviets and been um, uh, treated in a, a quite horrific manner by both sides. And it's when Hitler fights his war in the West, Hitler invades um, Scandinavia, uh, Norway, and Denmark in April 1940. And then sweeps across uh, France, Belgium and Luxembourg in May 1940, pushing the British expeditionary force back to Dunkirk. And um, just as just at the time, Winston Churchill is um, having his first weeks as prime minister and the British are evacuated and France falls uh, some week later. And Hitler returns to Germany. He returns to Berlin from his sort of triumphal tour of Paris where well, there's some uh, famous photos of him with his architect Arno Brecker looking at the kind of the glories of Paris. And he was thinking of having Paris raised to the ground. But then he thought, well, no, I'm not going to do that because my new super Berlin I'm going to build um, is just going to cause Paris to wither away to a kind of a, a, a nothingness. So we'll just let Paris die off. So he returns to Germany and he returns by train and arrives at the Anhalter Bahnhof which you can find, let's just go and look at my little note, the, the Anhalt Bahnhof station, which was the, the kind of the Berlin's, Berlin's great kind of work of um, architectural modernism. Um, and at that point, he is cheered by um, the population at large. He, the um, Berliners flock and they throw garlands of flowers on his car. Now, the reason why this happens isn't because they think, wonderful, we've had our war and it's fantastic. It was relief. Uh, even um, old communists and social democrats who hated Hitler thought to themselves, well, fair, fair play. He pulled that off. He brought France to its knees in six weeks and the Kaiser tried to do it over four years and failed. Surely now the stubborn and stupid British <laughs> will see reason. Surely now they will come to terms and see that Germany has been restored. Hitler was the man to do it. And th that'll be the end of it. We've just had a 
We just had a quick little war to restore our, our national status. And then the war doesn't stop then, and it goes on and on. And that moment when Hitler returns to the, the Anhalt, to Bahnhof, is the, the pinnacle of his, his popularity. It's all downhill from there. And it was a kind of... The problem for Hitler at that moment is that he believed everything he'd ever thought about himself, about his indestructibility, about his infallibility, and about how that he was the divine historical... Um, will in human form of the German people. All these things that sort of, you know, megalomaniac people think when uh, pride comes before fall. And that was why, so he never, he never really replicates those successes of 1940, largely because of those cheering crowds. They uh, appealed to his, his vanity, they appealed to the, the fantasy that he had about himself of infallibility. If you go and look at what's left of the Anhalter station, there's just a kind of a, a ruined archway there now. Almost that, that that's that's the point where um, Hitler believed his own myth too much, and you know I think the rest is perhaps perhaps history. Uh, there you go. When does Berlin go from capital city in a country that's at war to really feeling the war? On a number of moments, but perhaps the most significant one is in early 1943. So uh, from autumn or fall, if you're Amer for American listeners, 1942, the uh, German Sixth Army that had marched triumphantly into Paris, it um, surrounds the city on the Volga, Stalingrad, and besieges it, and is gradually drawn into the siege and um, ground up in the city. And then it's surrounded by Soviet armies in uh, a, a pocket and, uh, and destroyed. And when news gets back to Berlin that the Sixth Army has been lost, and Paulus, uh, Hitler's inexperienced field marshal, who was given the title of field marshal just before surrender, Hitler assuming that no German field marshal has ever surrendered without putting a bullet in his brain first, and this might be, give uh, Paulus an incentive to fight on. Um, when the Sixth Army was lost, uh, there's widespread shock amongst German people, uh, amongst Berliners, and a, a sense of, of dread and foreboding that really this, the outcome of the war has been foretold and undecided. And Hitler, uh, by early 1943, has kind of retreated from public life. He's become a, he's quite unwell. He's suffering from heart problems, Parkinson's disease. Um, and there probably a couple of other complaints as well. His doctor, uh, Theo Morel, was keeping him uh, going with a kind of a vast and exotic cocktail of uh, narcotics, you know, uh, Valiums and um, amphetamines and all these sorts of things. And so the person who steps into Hitler's place as a, as a kind of the public face of the Reich is Joseph Goebbels. And Goebbels um, holds a party, a convention of the party faithful, the Berlin uh, Sports Palace on the Potsdamer Strasse, that was in Schoenberg, which was uh, originally this kind of great pre-war bit of kind of modernist architecture designed to create a, a sporting venue for um, working class people to enjoy. He uses that to... Sp give a, a speech uh, probably unlike any other in the regime. Um, and this, this, the Sports Palace speech essentially says, um, we're really in it now, guys. You know, we are in for a long, long, the, the easy war, that's not happening anymore. Because of setbacks and because, you know, we've been stabbed in the back again, obviously, by the Jews, we're in for a long period of struggle. And the uh, everyone is going to have to be involved. Um, everybody is going to have to sacrifice the days of sort of idleness and luxury for Berlin's are over. And most of what he, he demands as a result of this speech, um, he calls it um, a policy of total war, uh, has a limited effect on Germany's chances in the war, because in, in a way, Soviet, American and British military production um, is so, so much greater than anything that the, the Germans can muster, that uh, and the manpower that is now being put in the field from 1943 onwards is so enormous that the, the outcome of the war is in no doubt really 
because he says, well, let's we'll close down anything that is not related to war activities. So cafes, restaurants, bars, nightclubs, um, anything like that, they all get shut down. Cinemas. And all the resources diverted to the front. And we want to kind of make sure that there, there are no shirkers and idlers and people who are getting away with things. And um, it's, it, it has more of a propaganda value than anything else. Uh, any kind of practical efforts. And after this, the, the establishment of the, the Volkssturm, um, the, the, the people's storm, which were really kind of old men and young boys, um, who create who are made who are formed into kind of citizens battalions to take on the red army most of whom are um killed the this is another visual indicator to berliners that um things are not turning out very well yeah so i was at Le camp german war cemetery in normandy there were some graves of some not as young as i think ended up in berlin but of, there you know i saw a lot of graves of 16 year olds and um it really makes you realize what the situation in Germany was like, that that's who mm. had to be there. Yeah. Bear in mind that the, the young young men from America who piloted the, the B-17s over Berlin were, wouldn't have been much older. You know, these were, these were kids. And I think leaders on all sides know that you can get young men to do things. A guy like me ain't, you know, <laughs> <laughs> my age of 43 ain't never going to do. Well, actually, so my grandfather was a B-17 bomber and flew over Berlin. He flew on D-Day. He flew 35 missions, which was not something that I actually knew about him because he he's a really interesting person, but I never met him because he, so he was a bomber during World War II. And then afterwards, he was an FBI agent. But in uh, the 50s, when my father was three, um, probably from a combination of PTSD from all of that experience, he ended up committing suicide. And so they're not family stories that we know that well because there's nobody around anymore that knew him really. So, But we have all of his like records. And so, yeah, so even if they made it out, they maybe didn't make it out. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, indeed. I'm going off on, a, on an aside here. Uh, I, I, I met one of the veterans of the um, British Air War of, of Bomber Command and this guy was in his 90s and, and told me, you know, of, of the daylight, because the, the Americans flew the daylight raids, the British flew at night. And he said, you know, there was so many of so many of his guys were um, uh, discharged with the, at the end of the war and committed suicide within the next, you know, one or two years um, just because of the, the amount of trauma that they um, they lived with. So the yeah, there was... Um, a horrendous kind of post-war attrition rate uh, amongst bomber pilots in general, I think, is um, uh, Germany's a very, very badly treated. And but there you go. This is uh, uh, this is militarism for you. Yeah. Well, so there's an organization called Liberation Europe that I really like, and I went with. I traveled with them in June to go to the D-Day anniversary, and then uh, one of their historians did an episode about the beaches in Normandy, uh, probably five or six episodes ago. And that's one of the things we talked about is like liberation is never really liberation. Like even if your village got liberated, people still died and pe women still got raped. And it was war is not ever kind. Uh, rather unfortunately for, for as we are stuck with this fantasy, really world war one being the bad war, world war two being the, the good one. You know, because you know there was a, a more a more obvious and clear cut bad guy in World War Two, but the reality is that uh, World War Two was primarily a war waged against civilians, and the the, the numbers of um, civilian deaths um, compared to the First World War are are immense, and so um, again, again uh, uh, Berliners know this by by the end of the of the war. Their, their city was destroyed and um, under uh, occupation primarily by the the Red Army who um, and I know we haven't probably got time for this one but the uh, degree of sexual violence that traveled with the Red Army into Germany uh, is still a, a topic of, of kind of immense um, debate and, um, and discussion uh, so yeah Berlin has paid the price of Hitler's war in the end uh, in, in no uncertain terms. 
What was it like immediately following the war before the wall was up? What was it like for Berliners living in this divided city, defeated in a war with two different occupying forces going divergent ways? Well, the, the, wall, the wall obviously goes up in 1961 um, and the, the Berlin airlift is the, the kind of the first great event um, of the, the post-war era. Uh, but it was a, <clears throat> for Berliners, there are, they are um, facing uh, kind of an unpre- unprecedented existential crisis, really, that very quickly the the Nazi past has to be uh, erased. Um, the process of denazification um, is being carried out. German people are becoming aware of their country's uh, involvement in crimes across Europe. Interestingly, the, the question of the Holocaust and the Jews um, doesn't feature uh, preeminently at the Nuremberg trials until the, the last trial, the industrialists trial in 1947. And the, 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 that's only because American prosecutors during the industrialists trial, this was the trial of uh, the guys at IG Farben, um, who had run Auschwitz Monowitz, the the the, the, rub, the synthetic rubber plant at um, Auschwitz? They'd used slave labour, um, and they they couldn't seem to. Uh, the, the American prosecutors tried to get them on the idea that well, you'd provided arms and ammunition and all the other bits and bobs of war for Hitler, and the defence was well, didn't Britain's ICI do exactly the same? Didn't Standard Oil in America do exactly the same? Why are you giving us a hard time? And then they discovered that they'd used slave labor at Auschwitz. And then they, those were the only prosecutions brought, really, um, pertaining to the Holocaust, the uh, question of the Jews, to some extent, was uh, for, for a, a good number of decades allowed to slip away. And it was only really from the 60s initially, and then, but more so in the 80s and 90s, that really are kind of um, worldwide international Holocaust obsession has um, uh, become, you know, the, the, the key defining feature of Nazism. Prior to that, in the historical memory in places like Britain and America, it, it's, it's not as such. Um, but, but for Berliners, the question as to, I suppose, national sovereignty um, is, is a really, very really important one. The the idea that re- that the, the country simply doesn't exist anymore. It is divided into occupied zones, and whether there will be, uh, you know, what will be the fate of Germany is unclear. But certainly, for most Berlin, is it was whatever the fate of Germany, we don't want Stalin, uh, and um, keeping Stalin out of of West Germany was uh, the the kind of the, the the imperative task. After the war, after they had been split. When did they start to feel like two, di- like they were two different people? Um, that's a good, it's a, a good question. And, and the, the extent to which they did feel this um, is, is debatable. Obviously, there's a huge, um, from 1945 through to 1961, there's a huge exodus of Berliners from east to west. After the establishment of the wall in 1961, there are still some attempts to to get across it and uh, some aspirations towards um, a, a life in, uh, in West Germany. But I think what happens is that it's always the next generation where changes really, ha- really happen. You know, the, the, the generation that are born, the, the, the adults at the time that the uh, East Germany is uh, established, they're always the, uh, the the generation that think, well, we're, we're kind of trapped here, really. We'll have to make the best of it. And it's the children that are the ones that become uh, are more likely to uh, kind of embrace Marxist-Leninism and uh, believe the stories that they, um, the establishment of the GDR was um, part of the kind of the great fascist war. And thank goodness the Soviets came and rescued and liberated Germany from fascism and all, all that kind of thing. So, so yeah, it, I think for for that for an entirely a new kind of political culture to have emerged in uh, the GDR, my guess is um, that it, it took it took a generation. One thing that's important, and I'll, I'll have to leave you with this thought, but um, one thing that's always worth remembering is who made up 
the first generation of uh, secret policemen in the uh, in East Germany? How, how did the Soviets quickly find a bunch of winning guys to become the East German security services? And the answer was that they were all former Gestapo men. They were given a, a kind of a fairly straight choice between um, a one-way ticket to Siberia or Mein Kampf and read some Karl Marx and, um, and the works of Lenin and then continue doing what you were previously doing, spying on people, arresting them, just for different reasons this time. And, that's, that's what I found in Budapest, too, was so disheartening, is the, the turn that the arrow took towards communism. And yeah. It's, it's a similar story all over Eastern Europe. Something about totalitarianism, though, doesn't it? That yeah. The ideas are interchangeable, but the behaviors are, are kind of consistent, you know. So uh, two more questions before we go. Uh, one, what are some places that people should go if they want to see, I know you mentioned a few, but what are some other places people could go if they want to see evidence of wartime Berlin in modern Berlin? There is, well, okay, well, you could go to um, the Vance, um, uh, the Vance Museum in, uh, in Vance. Um, that's where the Vance conference took place. Um, and it's a, a kind of like a um, a uh, museum, a memorial to the Holocaust. Uh, the Vance Conference was obviously where, uh, in um, January 1942, where uh, where Reinhard Heydrich, who was uh, Himmler's number two guy, drew together bureaucratic figures from all over the Third Reich and from all over Germany's empire and said, OK, well, the, the Hitler's um, in, from the summer of 1941 or onwards has said uh, all Jews across Europe, not just German ones, all Jews, every single one has to go. And, you know, the, the final solution is upon us. And tell me what you are all doing at the moment. You know, tell me what initiatives you're doing to kill them in large numbers. And then they, uh, from that, um, they agreed on a kind of a, a, a systematic approach to um, shipping Jews from all over Europe to um, outfits now to kill them. So, a morbid place, but certainly an interesting one. The obviously um, the uh, the Reichstag and the Brandenburg Gate uh, worth going to. The Brandenburg Gate being the kind of the the front line between East and West. And if it's still there, I think it probably is. If you go up the the Prince Albrecht Albrechtstrasse, um, the, the old Gestapo headquarters for Berlin would be there, where people would be um, summoned. Uh, and sometimes arrested and, and taken to for uh, interrogation. So those are, are some sort of original things. You might, there are obviously innumerable um, memorials in East and West to, not just to the, um, the Holocaust, and there's the, the Berlin um, Holocaust Memorial, um, but also there are memorials to the Soviets that fought and died to take Berlin. The Soviet Memorial Google it. I can't remember where it is off the top of my head, but it's quite, a, quite an impressive thing to see. Uh, so I've seen some of those, but I haven't seen all of those. I'm going to have to, I know I'm going to go back to Germany. I was there in May, but I know I'm going to go back. Um, so I'm going to write those down and take that list with me. Um, and finally, last question, uh, where can our listeners find you if they want to check out your amazing show? You can find me at, uh, um, you can Google the Explaining History podcast and the, uh, the, the pod, you, we're on iTunes. The provider, if you want to go straight to that, is ACAST. It's www.acast.com forward slash Explaining History. Um, or just come and say hi on the Facebook page. Um, we've got some awesome conversations going on there at the moment about, you know, history and memory and censorship and all all these kinds of things. So, you know, swing by and, and say hi on the Explaining History Facebook page. Um, I always like to have a kind of a chat. Well, excellent. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate you coming on the show. Yeah. And um, you are welcome to come back anytime because you are an expert on many, many topics. Love to. Love to. Thanks, Nick. I want to say thank you again to Nick for coming on the show. I've been listening to his show, Explaining History, for almost a year, and I find that no matter where I go in Europe, he tends to have episodes that really help me understand the history of the places that I'm traveling. 
I first downloaded his show in Budapest, and I have it on my website listed as one of the 18 podcasts that I use for travel inspiration. I definitely encourage you to check out his show. One of the things that's cool is it's only a 15-minute show, and he switches up his topics a lot. So it's, it's, just, it's just a gem. You should really check it out some housekeeping. Uh, Happy New Year. This episode comes out on January 1st, which makes it the first episode of 2018. On January 2nd, I leave for Thailand. So if you want to explore some of the UNESCO sites I'm going to see in Asia, find me on Facebook and Instagram. My handle is at History Fangirl. I have lots of travel plans for the new year, but I'd love to hear what your travel plans are. Uh, let me know. You can let me know on Facebook or shoot me an email to Stephanie at historyfangirl.com and let me know what trips you and your family or friends are thinking about for 2018. It'll also help me figure out what shows I'm planning on doing for the year. So if I know there are places that a few different listeners are going to go that I've been, I'll definitely look to see if that's a show that I can put together. Finally, if you want to support the show, head over to Patreon. The link is in the show notes. It's not too late to become a Patreon uh, for January. And I want to thank you all so much for listening.